This is Kentucky Afield Radio. This is Ron Rohde, Kentucky Afield's first host back in 1953. Now, I'm proud to present Charlie Baglin. If you follow NASP Archery at all, through your kids, through Facebook, or you go to the major tournaments, two names that you'll quickly recognize are Morel Targets and the International Bow Hunting Organization. Just ahead on the show, we'll talk to Bernie Morel and the IBO president, Brian Markham, two people of many who are stepping forward to make archery awesome in a kid's life. They're proud to be part of it, and they'll tell us why, next on Kentucky Afield Radio. Whatever you do at a river or a lake, here's something you can believe in. If you're swimming, boating, or in prayer that you'll catch that big fish, Kentucky Conservation Officers remind you, your life jacket's got your back. In the news, whales have been spotted in Kentucky waters. We have an expert standing by on the water's edge. There goes the bobber. (laughs) Set the hook. Daddy, it's a whale. Way to go, buddy. Childlike wonder for the outdoors. It still exists. Where to go, what to take, and how to get started are waiting at the Kentucky Fish and Wildlife website, fw.ky.gov. Take a kid fishing. Don't let the opportunity get away. This is Kentucky Field Radio. My name is Charlie Baglin. A couple of folks on the show today I know you're going to like, especially if you or your kids are involved in archery around the state. With 110, I got these numbers the other day, between 110,000 and 130,000 kids in Kentucky schools participate every year in NASP Archery. That's the National Archery in the Schools program. That's a bunch. And if you've ever been to any of the major tournaments, let's say the national tournament that's held in Louisville every year, thousands upon thousands of kids from all over the nation go there, then chances are you've seen a couple of names. One is Morel Targets. We can humanize that Morel brand because it actually is the last name of a couple of brothers from northwest Arkansas, Dale Morel and Bernie Morel. We will be talking this hour with Bernie Morell, and we'll talk about why that company, Morell Targets, one of the biggest in the world, is giving so much to the success of student archers. Something else new in the life of a young archer these days, the NASP IBO 3D Challenge. 3D, three-dimensional, so it's not a paper target. It looks more lifelike, like uh, an animal. But it's a new type of tournament. It's part of the NASP National and World Tournaments. More of a real life, in the woods experience by a young outdoorsman or outdoorswoman would experience. Champion archer and president of IBO, Brian Markham, is on the phone with me now from his office in northern Ohio, right there on Lake Erie. Welcome, Brian, and please define IBO. The International Bow Hunting Organization. We have affiliates in uh, many different countries, uh, South Africa, New Zealand, Australia, some European countries. When the IBO has a tournament and you hunt with a target that's called 3D, I've seen both, and so I know. But when you think archery target, oftentimes it's it's, it's, uh, concentric rings and you're shooting for a bullseye. That's not necessarily the case with the 3D target. Well, the 3D target is a simulated animal target. It's three-dimensional, and it does have scoring rings in within the target. Uh, you can't usually see those with the naked eye. We allow binoculars to be used so that they can see where to aim on the target, but they are rewarded for a well-placed arrow, just like you would be on a bullseye target. Uh, We have a center 11 ring, and then we have a 10 ring. Outside of the 10 ring, which we consider the heart-lung area, is an 8 ring, and anything outside of that 8 ring is scored as a 5. 
So we do have scoring areas within that uh, simulated animal target. It's just not as visible as a bullseye target would be. So when you have a tournament, I know with NASPAR tree, which we'll talk about in a sec, that top score could be 300, like bowling. Yeah. What is the top score with an IBO 3D target? It would be a 440. We shoot 40 targets with a, a possible 11 on each target. Now, talking about the NASP IBO partnership, that's the National Archery in the Schools program, thousands of kids all over the state and the nation, the world, taking part of that now, and also now new to it, uh, now in your second year, is your organization, Brian, and you were part of the big tournament, I say big and understatement, tournament, the national tournament in Louisville in May. That went pretty well for you. Yes, it did. We had nearly 3,000 students come through our 3D range. Of course, it it pales in comparison to the amount of bullseye shooters that are there, but we did increase our numbers substantially from last year, which was the first year that we offered the 3D tournament in partnership with the NAS event. So we're looking forward to bigger and better things every year. We actually set a new world record for a 3D event this year with 2,841 registered participant. The previous record was held by the IBO at one of our world championships at Snowshoe, West Virginia, and that record was 2,450 competitors. Yes, you beat so that by nearly 400. We did. We, we beat that by nearly 400 competitors, and I, I anticipate breaking that every year uh, with the amount of excitement that we have for 3D archery among the, uh, the NASP uh, participants. I like the partnership because it gives the archery student who is typically shooting a bullseye an option, something else to shoot at, if you will. And so we have the 3D range, we have a 3D target, another tournament, if you will, at the tournament. Is the youth that is involved in NASP, is that changing the face, potentially, of IBO? I think it will eventually. It's so new right now that we haven't seen that trickle down to the IBO events, but I'm I'm certain that it will in future years. As you said, we wanted to do this to offer an additional competition for those NAS bullseye competitors. We also wanted to provide outdoor opportunities outside of the classroom setting. Most of the uh, bullseye competition originates within the classroom and, uh, you know, phys ed classes and school activities. We want to get them outside of that gymnasium and get them in the outdoors. And eventually, we hope that uh, we will see outdoors men and women uh, come from this uh, NASP-IBO partnership. We know that once they're involved in the outdoors and they see everything that we have to offer there, that eventually that they will want to buy hunting licenses and participate that way. But we just want to provide that opportunity, and wherever it takes them, that's fine with us. The NASP involvement, that wasn't the first time that you've had a youth contingent to the IBO, am I right? What have you been doing all these years to gain new membership, to recruit new members with the IBO? Right. The IBO has always uh, offered youth classes. Uh, You know, we have many of our clubs provide uh, teaching opportunities for the youth, but we offer several classes. I think we have eight classes total for young archers and youth archers. Up to eight years old, we offer a future bow hunter range, and they shoot 10 targets under a very controlled uh, atmosphere there. And then we go to our cub class, which is 9 to 12 years old, and then to our youth classes that are all the way up to 17-year-olds before uh, they enter our adult classes. You know, archery is a lifelong sport. We have archers in their 80s competing still. So we are trying to fill those ranks with young archers to help our sport grow. At the National Championship in Lowell, your range was indoors. Normally, it's outside, right? That's correct. Uh, We hold one tournament indoors, and that is our indoor world championship at the IX Center in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, Other than that, the other six major tournaments that we do are outdoors. 
what we tried to do there was we tried to make it as close to their tournament setting as possible, as close to what they're used to. So we had to put those targets uh, in a line, and the first target is their 10-meter target. The last target is their 15-meter target. And in between is an unknown distance. So it's similar in that way to the IBO event but we wanted to keep it as close to the format as possible uh, as what they're used to with the bull fight guy. We will have more with Brian Markham from the IBO when we come back. You're listening to Kentucky Field Radio. Back on Kentucky Field Radio. My name is Charlie Beglin, and Brian Markham, head of the International Bow Hunting Organization, is on the phone with me for the first 30 minutes of the show, anyway. Some sports are indoor sports, some are outdoor sports. Basketball, well, regular people play it outdoors, but pros play inside. College plays inside, high school inside. Everybody else, we play it outside. Tennis, that's both, depending on weather. Baseball is both, I guess, depending on weather, if they close the roof. Football, both. Archery is both, depending. NASP archery is an indoor sport, but 3D target archery typically is outdoors. So we're now combining the two. That last crowning moment of the NASP IBO tournament that's outdoors now. That's something new for young archers. That's correct. Uh, we will be moving the NASP IBO Challenge outdoors at our world championship. And what that does is it just creates the next step for them. You know, we, we're indoors at the Nationals. We're indoors at the NASP World. And at the IBO World, we're going to move them outdoors with the same range set up, only outside. And then they can see the opportunities that are available to them through our tournament. It's a nice festival atmosphere at the uh, Holiday Valley Ski Resort where we hold our world championship. So your outdoor uh, course at the Worlds? It will be on flat ground, normally uh, at the ski resort on our trail courses. Um, It's pretty rugged terrain. But they have an area that... um, they have a golf course and a driving range, and we're we're planning on setting up this uh, 3D range right by our uh, one of our known yardage uh, practice ranges uh, where they practice before they go out. So they'll have the same you know flat area set up just like their uh, indoor ranges, only it will be outdoors. It's clear you've given this some thought. And what it sounds like, let's liken it to horse racing. You have the Triple Crown, the Derby, the Preakness, the Belmont Stakes, but in archery, tell me how that's set up. The NASP Nationals in Louisville is the first star of the three-star event. The second star is the NASP World in Nashville. The third star is at our World Championship in Ellicottville, New York. Now, there will be... uh, those scores for for the participants that uh, participate in each one of those will be added together and we'll have an overall champion for those three events. Will they even get as much as a taste of outdoor archery, let's say as soon as the World Tournament for NASP in Nashville? No, in Nashville it will be indoors. At our World Championship in Ellicottville it will be outdoors. Is that going to throw a curve to many archers, you think, that are typically shooting indoors? They like the fact that there's no noise, there's no wind, there's no sun glare, there's no rain, there's no... It's prime conditions indoors. That's correct, and and they will have to adapt to that. That is one of the issues with shooting outside is you have all those outside factors, and it, and it forces you to focus more on your shooting. You know, when you have birds flying by and cars going by and the wind blowing and and uh, different elements to deal with those are distractions and you have to avoid those distractions and concentrate more and uh, i think that they will enjoy it i think most people do in- enjoy shooting outdoors you know it's something that they will will get used to i think that it'll be a um, a different uh experience for them and i think they'll really enjoy it 
in case people hear this program outside of Kentucky, we know we have been introduced to the NASP IBO 3D Challenge in this state. What about California, Montana? What about the rest of the nation? Is the popularity there with the new 3D range as you anticipated? It is growing. More and more coaches are purchasing 3D targets to be able to um, to offer uh, 3D to their students. Several states um, have included a 3D competition in their state tournament. And uh, we would like to see all the NASP states get involved. And uh, we've talked about hiring a NASP IBO 3D coordinator to help uh, with the implementation of that program. So we are looking to uh, grow 3D throughout all of the NASP states, and uh, I think eventually we'll get there. And that's just going to increase the numbers at nationals and encourage them to move on and and, uh, do 3D archery outdoors. I'm sure there was some apprehension of how is this going to catch on. Obviously, it's a hit. Where do you think this will lead in 10 years? Oh, I think uh, I think we'll we'll have challenges trying to find uh, venues large enough to hold this tournament. Uh, we've already seen a lot of excitement from the kids uh, when it comes to shooting 3D. Um, you know, the coaches are excited now. Now we do have some challenges with some of the coaches that are holding their kids back because they don't want to mess them up for their bullseye event. The bullseye is such a prestigious event with so much scholarship money involved that their coaches are still trying to hold them back. But this year, we've given away $24,500 in scholarship money. That is changing a lot of, uh, a lot of opinions about the 3D range. So I think more and more are going to get involved now that they see it's not just a novelty shoot. There's actually something at stake there. You know, they, they have the same awards that are given at the uh, Bullseye event, and we are also giving away scholarship money. So this is changing a lot of those coaches' opinions of 3D. I bet it is. That is definitely a win-win. You have to do it all, don't you? You wear a lot of hats. Let me put it that way. Yeah, I do. I wear a lot of hats, and um, I've been conditioned uh, to do that over the years. I spent 30 years as the uh, parks director for the city of Norwalk, and uh, we had a small department. I wore many hats there, and I was never too proud to do any of the jobs. You know, I've kind of taken that um, that experience to the IBO, and you know, it's not uh, it's not unusual uh, this time of year for me to put in over 80 hours a week just doing the things that need to be done, whether it's uh, changing the oil in the IBO truck to. Uh, you know, um, uh, building uh, uh, ground quivers for the uh, for the NASP uh, IBO 3D challenge. There's a lot of things that need to be done, and and a lot of times, if if I don't do them, they won't get done. And I want to make sure this is the best best experience for the kids and and the best possible tournament that we can make it. So, what's going on in your life between now and the August World Championship? Well, uh, we're we're heavily into our outdoor 3D season right now. We just finished up with the first leg of the national championship uh, last weekend. Um, The second leg will be June 12th through the 14th. Uh, The third leg will be July 10th through 12th. And now in July, I've got back-to-back-to-back tournaments. So the 10th through 12th is our third leg. The 17th through the 19th is our trad world, which will be in Tennessee this year. And then um, the NASP world will be the 23rd through the 25th. And then we go right to our IBO world, which is August 7th through the 9th. There's a lot going on this time of year. I don't know how you, in the world you could have the time to do it. I know you still have to mow your lawn and do your laundry. Yeah, somewhere in there all the time anyway. Yeah, and I have a very supportive wife. Um, this will be our 30th uh, anniversary this year, and, and she's been great. But once in a while, she does remind me that I have a few things at home that need to be done. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, she's married to a champion, and uh, you've done good work with uh, uh, Behind the Bow yourself and now with the IBO as the president, and now with a, a new generation of kids coming your way out of the NASP rank. So uh, good luck with all that in the future. 
thank you. And we're we're very excited about uh, giving these kids this opportunity, and it's, it's very rewarding. No matter how many hours I have to put in and how tired I am, at the end of the day, you think about you know what you're actually accomplishing, and it's all worth it. So we hope that these kids and enjoy the outdoors as much as as I have, uh, as much as the other archers do. Um, you know, I grew up in an archery family. My dad took me bow hunting at an early age, and and I just want these kids to be able to experience that for themselves. Two last questions. Where can folks find out more about NASP IBO or simply IBO? Well, you can find uh, information on the NASP website and also on ours at IBO.net. So we, we have information about our all of our tournaments and schedules, and we'll be putting up uh, more information as we get closer to the, uh, the National IBO World Championship. We'll have lodging information and, and different things that the, the kids will need to know um, in order to get to our World Championship in Ellicottville, New York. Very good. And do you or do you not text and drive? I do not text and drive. That's a good man. It's just not worth it. So... No, I do not do that. Okay, sounds good, Charlie. Thanks. Brian Markham, IBO president and all-around good guy. And next up, we'll have our fishing report plus a conversation with a man whose name has taken a lot of shots over the years, quite literally. It's the name you see in the corner of every archery target, pretty much since the Archery in the Schools program began. Bernie Morrell, stay tuned to Kentucky Field Radio. This is Charlie Baglin. We're back on Kentucky Field Radio, fishing the port standing by. If you're looking for something fun to do next week, coming up July 23rd, 24th, and 25th, drive down to Nashville, Nashville, Tennessee. That's where the 2015 World NASP Tournament is being held downtown at the Music City Center. It's a huge venue. You'll love it. It's going to be great for archery. going to be great for the kids who go. A big contingent of shooters from Kentucky will be there, I promise you, plus schools from around the country, from around Canada, schools from England, Namibia, and South Africa. This truly is a world championship. It's the Wimbledon of archery, the Super Bowl. And it's not that far away. You can learn more at naspschools.org. It is time now for our fishing report. Did you grab the mayonnaise? We've got to meet Bob and Cindy at the little store to buy some lunch stuff. Where's John? Oh, he said he left something in his room. He's coming. Did you grab the mayonnaise? What do you think? Ham, chips? I put that mustard we like in the cooler. Did you grab the mayonnaise? Oh, oh, here he comes. Good. He grabbed his life jacket. I should have remembered that. Did you grab the mayonnaise? Cupcakes. I want those yellow cupcakes. Uh, tell your phone. Boaters are busy. On and off the water. That's why Kentucky Conservation Officers remind you. Your life jacket's got your back. This is Kentucky Field Radio, and my name is Charlie Baglin. Good things happen because oftentimes good people step forward and say, hey, I believe in this. I would like to contribute. Not so much that they are chasing personal reward or dollar signs, but they're nurturing a good idea. That's how Morell Targets came to be a key supporter of the National Archery in the Schools program, something we call NASP. Bernie Morrell joins me from his home in northwest Arkansas, a little town called Alma. You and I were talking in Louisville. We were having lunch one day, and I made the mistake of saying, are you the president of the organization? You quickly corrected me. No, my brother owns the company. I don't know what you, what my title would be. I'm a contractor. I do all of our building, collect our warehouses, and uh, I have sales. I do the NAS program. I handle uh, international sales. I have several different titles, but uh, no, I'm not the owner by no means. A lot of people in Kentucky who have kids, grades, uh, what, 4 through 12, are very familiar with NASP tournaments, and they will see your targets, the paper targets, concentric rings. They know that your name is on those targets, but that's not the only archery tournament that you have targets appearing. Where else are your targets found? Well, we uh, we sponsor the NFA, the National Field Archery Association, and the International Bow Hunters Organization. 
and uh, several organizations like that, Center Shop Ministries, and uh, and we try to stay involved with all the youth organizations and as many uh, archery programs as we can, and uh, we try to work in every state as as much as possible, and uh, we have. Uh, uh, different uh, different things that we do for a sponsorship and uh, like for NAS we uh, you know we try to do this uh, be part of the scholarship sponsorship but we not only do that but uh, uh, our sponsorship there uh, with NAS goes into we donate every state tournament target for free and then uh, we track sales in the state and for however many targets of ours that are sold in the state, uh, we give the state director back fifteen dollars per target to help promote the program in that state. You know, so we we try to work at the grassroots level and then try to help at the national level also. You have been interested in youth archery for quite some time, and you were telling me months ago that when you heard about NASP and how it was being organized, you said you wanted to be a part of that. Well, it did. The way that come about, actually, Charlie, is uh, I actually had a company of my own, and I was running it, and I and it started out as a, as I had a dream or a vision, but it was so vivid that the next morning I came straight here to Dale's office and told him, I said, there's some kind of an archery program out there that's in the schools, and I just need to be a part of it. I feel led to uh, get involved. I said, it was kind of overwhelming what I experienced last night, so I just want to make sure that there's something there. And he was telling me about the NAS program, and it had just started. And uh, so I asked him to get me a, a meeting with the, in the next conference meeting, and and uh, and it was in April. Well, this uh, this dream was probably around the first of the year in February, and in March I had a massive heart attack. Mm. And I didn't get to go to the to the first conference meeting. I had to actually wait a year. But in that time frame, uh, around December, or I know I think that back was October, I became a, a full time employee here, and I'd been working here for 20 years doing trade shows and stuff every year, and I'd just come in to help whenever they needed something. But I never did have an actual title here. And uh, as I came on here, it was NAS coordinator, and then I, of course, like I say, I do sales and everything else. But uh, but uh, that's kind of how I got involved. I, and uh, what year was this? You had that first meeting. Uh, it was in 2004. I think we were two years behind getting on board. We had done some things with the NAS program, but it wasn't very much. And I uh, got to attend that April in 2004, and uh, at the meeting, I was talking with Jenny Richardson there. I asked her, I said, I need to talk to whoever's uh, the head of this. I said, uh, whoever the CEO is, because I need to talk to him and tell him what I think, you know, and what I see. And and, uh, and she introduced me to Kevin Stay. And I got to sit down with Kevin Stay for a little bit there, and I kind of was telling him the story story that I'm telling you, and he looked at me, he goes, you know, I think you're the first one in the industry that has come to me that actually understands what's taking place here. And I said, well, it's by divine intervention, I can tell you that. It's not because of what, if anything, me. I said, I, I feel led. And so when I left that meeting, on my way home, I was trying to figure out how I could contribute uh, to the NAS program, and I decided that I was going to try to buy all state tournament tr trophies for each individual state to take that burden off of them so when they'd done their awards, you know, they would be wouldn't be out that little bit of cost. If I could do that, I felt like I was contributing. And then I got back in here to the office and was telling Dale, you know, I said, look, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to I'm going to uh, sponsor the, uh, the the trophies. And he goes, you really that feel that strong about? It? I go, absolutely. He said, well, here's what you do. He said, you fly all the state coordinators in, and we'll bring them all into the White River and Roy and the gang, and we'll get to know them and, and, and figure out the program and see what we can do to help them. And so that's what we did. We flew, uh, flew everybody in that was available, and uh, we had our uh, a NAS conference up here and got to do a little trout fishing at the same time and got acquainted with everybody, and that's where it all started, actually. So you're going back to 2004. Weren't that many states involved at that time, maybe three Maybe? No, no, they were. I think Charlie. I think there was more than that. I think they were in in the neighborhood. Of, when I got there, they might have been twenty or so. Or oh. it was getting legs under it at that time. It was starting to take off. You know. So you provide the targets. You provide target faces. You have provided for NASP the trophies, and I swear I didn't know that until today when you just told me. Yeah. Sounds like there was more to this than just the ability to sell more targets because. You're giving everything away. What well, was the draw? Well, the NAS program, we don't, uh, it's not something, we have, we're a fairly large company, and we sell a lot of products. And uh, But with on the NAS side of it, we don't necessarily try to make a profit off the NAS side of it. What we try to accomplish here is we give 
you know, we kind of worked that target on a 40% margin, and out of the 40% margin, we give 33% of it back to NASH. So we keep that small percentage to run uh, our clerical and uh, some of our expenses in this. But as a rule, like I say, 33% goes back into NASH to help promote the program, and we've been doing that uh, since the, since we got involved in it. So we've always been trying to promote the program. We're a platinum sponsor in, in the NASH program, and we've uh, we've contributed over the years quite a bit of money, and it's kind of a passion for us, and not only with uh, the NAS program, but uh, my brother here that has the company, he has a program out there, Youth Outdoor Education. And we're trying to develop and figure on the different ways to help keep uh, the youth enacted in, in, in the, the outdoors. And so we work pretty hard on trying to, to establish those type of programs. And that's not something that we look at, you know, and uh, as a, uh, a way, a means of making a living. We look at those to help promote the, to help promote the overall picture of archery. You said it was divine intervention. You felt a calling to yeah. do this. You obviously, from your heart, want to help kids. Is that because uh, you see them maybe going down the wrong path, or you want to see them become more interested in archery or the outdoors, conservation? What's on that list? To keep mentoring them and, and helping develop them, and maybe we could change the youth in America. And in this vision that I was telling you about, that was part of what I saw in this dream or this vision was a teacher talking 50 years into the future, talking about a program that helped change the development of the youth in America, and it was the National Arts and Schools program, and she was teaching it in a history class. Hmm. And what was so overwhelming to me about the vision or the dream is that's what got, you know, it, that's what brought me to the realization that I had to get involved because I really felt from the depth of my heart that that would be the case if we put our hearts into it, that, that somewhere down the road that accomplishment would be rewarded, you know, not, not necessarily be rewarded for us, but for the whole country, you know. So now we're looking back at least a dozen years. Yeah. What kind of improvements have you seen? Now I'm seeing those kids that were back then that have graduated school and they're now coaching and helping to to develop kids uh, in their classes. You know, uh, it's come full circle. I'm seeing them stay involved. And, uh, one of the most overwhelming things about this program is uh, uh, archery is in general. It's not only the profound effect that it has on the kid, but it's the effect that it has on the parents. You know, and you were talking about a lot of times the instance would be that uh, the kid wouldn't ever have the ability or be able to participate in anything at this type of level, and now that the, they've got involved in archery, they're getting to go to state and regional and national tournaments, and then being involved and getting to interact with their parents and uh, being able to participate, and the parents are as, as, as much excited as the kids are. I mean, I, I just get a big kick out of the parents. You know, they're just overwhelmed that their kids have got to do something like this, you know. And now we're talking about the scholarships coming along and the money that is involved here, and uh, now to be able to see kids that are probably would have never had a chance to go to college have the opportunity through scholarships and it's it's very rewarding who would have thought the game of bow and arrow would lead to something like this I know it is. This is just, uh, it's a blessing for everybody, you know. And uh, and I've and it's such a, been such a pleasure to uh, to see these kids over the last decade that's come up. And, and I've got I have a wall here in my office. I'm looking at. It. I have pictures of kids and and letters they've sent me and and photographs of the ranges. And I have a, a NAS Hall of Fame. I, I call it here in my office. And it's got you know kids I've met throughout the years. And and uh, I got their autographs. And they've done all kinds of things for me and uh you know i take more pride in that I, than i do anything in my office i guess you know i really get a kick out of looking back and uh and uh, get to see all these faces over and over you know and you keep busy with this now, how many archery tournaments can you count them as on, is on your calendar every year well i don't make as many as i did i think the most i've ever made in one year was 15 uh state tournaments you know and uh, now i probably don't get to make it about five or six or so, you know. But some of the state tournaments are so incredible. And uh, because I've never missed a Kentucky State Tournament. I've never missed one. And uh, I always attend it, and I love that one. Cause, and, that's, and that's where I know most of the people from is there in Kentucky, man. I, I try to stay involved in Kentucky. I, I feel like uh, the Crown Plaza there at the Expo Center in Louisville is my second home. It seems <laughs> like I spend about as much time there as I do anything. Name the biggies. The national tournament with the NAS program would probably be first. 
then uh, 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 the Vegas shoot would be second, and then the Kentucky State tournament would be third. Well, we've got two out of three. So if basketball, bourbon, and horses weren't enough, Kentucky now has archery to thank for putting it on the map. Bernie Morrell of Morrell Targets is my guest. More just ahead. I'm Charlie Baglin. You're listening to Kentucky Afield Radio. This is Kentucky Field Radio, and we're back with our final few minutes with Mr. Bernie Morrell, one of the top names in archery targets. Bernie Nasp is a hit around the world, and that has to make a sponsor or contributor like you proud. As students, their grades are better, attitudes are better, attendance is better, they're better archers, they're just plain better kids. They are, and it's it's amazing to watch them grow and how they're developing. You know, it's uh, over the years to be involved in them and, and just to see, you know, and, and, and all states is doing the same thing. You know, for example, here in Arkansas, our state tournament is, is only 2,500 kids, but that's only the only facility we have in the state, I think, that that we can use that can hold that many kids. And, and uh, you know, it's amazing how many in Indiana and all the other states and how big in Ohio and, and, uh, and Oklahoma and how big this has really gotten, you know. It's, a, it's, it's getting crazy. It is. It's huge. You told me a story about once upon a time, you had the opportunity to invest in Morel targets for a pot, a, a, a puny amount, a pocket yeah. change. Yeah, and I don't know whether he was sincere or if that was a setup. You know, I think you could have hold it to, held him to that in a court of law. <laughs> But it was for, what for like yeah. if you'll loan me fifty bucks, I'll make you a partner. What's well, how'd that story go? Well, no, he came to me one day. We were riding around his truck, and I didn't know. I think he and he was basically teasing me about it anyway. But he said, asked me if I had fifteen hundred dollars. I said, well, yeah, I've got fifteen hundred dollars. What do you need it for? And I'm thinking if he needs it for his family, that's cool. And he tells me, he goes, now nah, I'm going to start a a target manufacturing uh, company. And uh, when was this? What year? Oh gosh, man, this goes back like to eighty nine or somewhere. It goes way back, right. and uh, and I look at him like, nah, man. I mean, if you need it for your family, I give it to you. But to start that, I can't see any future in that. I'm probably going to hang on to it, you know. And uh, and I think he'd been to Walmart that day and uh, had talked to Walmart about selling a product, and he was needing to buy inventory to start producing for Walmart. And I just, you know, and you know, hindsight's twenty twenty, as they say. <laughs> and he said that for fifteen hundred dollars, he would yeah. make you equal partner. Yeah, he'd be part of us. You know, and I think he was probably knew that I wouldn't do it, and he was kind of teasing me. But uh, uh, who knows? He might, he might have been serious also. But uh, that would have been quite an investment, I can tell you. If you could say, Dale, hey, I, by the way, I've got that fifteen hundred. Yeah, and I, so now I, I, I want fifty percent. Uh, How big is your company? Well, we're about. In fact, I just built another add-on to a warehouse right now, and I'm looking at the blueprints at another addition. It's going to be around fifty thousand feet. But uh, uh, in total footage, I think we're two hundred fifty or sixty thousand feet or somewhere in that neighborhood. And we have we, we have probably forty or fifty trailers out there right now that are full of product. And then we'll pour this is said and done. Uh, the middle of June to July, we'll have a hundred semi trailers sitting out there full of product because we don't have enough warehouse to put them in. And we we start pushing product uh, out of here in June. It's it's a substantial amount. How many employees do you have working year round? About seventy employees that are full time employees, but uh, we hire actually every Friday. And uh, and uh, but in the summer months we put on probably another thirty or so employees. It, and now uh, here recently in the last month we put on our second shift. And uh, so uh, yeah, I think from this point forward as a company we will have to keep our second shift running all the time. Well, you never saw that coming back when he was bugging you for fifteen hundred <laughs> measly dollars. No, no. Now I walk in his office and tell him we need to do this or we need to expand, and I just watch the wrinkles on his forehead. You know, as he wrinkles up his forehead when I come here, he knows. I'm coming in to ask for something, you know. And, uh, but, yeah, he's got, you know, he's got a lot on his plate. There's a lot. When you have a company like this and uh, all aspects of it, you know, uh, you know, we probably keep about seven to nine million pounds of raw material here to build targets with at all, any given moment, you know. What city are you in? Uh, we're in Alma, Arkansas, just right outside of Fort Smith, Arkansas. If you're on Interstate 40, coming out of Oklahoma, we're at exit 13 as you come into Arkansas. So we're right here on the western side of Arkansas. So does that mean you like the Arkansas? Arkansas Razorbacks or the Sooners? 
Well, I'm a, I'm, I got to say this, and, and I mean it wholeheartedly. I am a Razorback. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care if you live one inch, if you live one inch over the border in Oklahoma, I'm sure you'd be a Sooner fan. Well, if you live one I'm inch into Arkansas. Way, yeah, like the hogs. I, I did buy a piece of property over in Oklahoma and lived over there for a little while. That did change my attitude any. I was a little <laughs> Razorback. Yeah. Yeah, you know, that's a great rivalry, the Southeast Conference, you know. And uh, I was talking to a friend the other day in, in Lexington, and we were talking about the, the basketball. And he said, man, I really hate it that Kentucky beat you guys, in, or Kentucky beat you on Arkansas. I said, I don't. I said, I expect Kentucky to win the, the, the championship, you know. If it ain't y'all, if it ain't us, I want us to be y'all or somebody yeah. in our conference, you know. I don't have any grudge against anybody in the Southeast Conference. I just want us to be on top every time, you know. You know, you can look back at archery in the schools program, and you can say these kids have learned, and maybe they could have learned by shooting a Coke can off of a fence post, but they didn't. They learned by shooting a morel target. And when you say, now I'm into the second generation, that this has come full circle, that we're getting quality archers out of this, and they're moving up. They're moving on to the IBO and into the NFAA, and you know, pros out there you know, hitting the bullseye 60 times in a row. Do you feel like you've really had a, you've made a difference or are making a difference? I think we're making a difference, and I think we have made a difference. I mean, when you go back to the NFAA, that was stuff that we were doing before the NAS program and the IBO, and and we used to do the ASA at one time, and uh, and so we've 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 been out there for for about thirty years now, and uh, we'd like to think that we've had some kind of impact for sure. You know, I don't know what that percentage would be, but uh, wholeheartedly, I think we do think that we've made some accomplishments. You know, and uh, and uh, you know, uh, one of these days, the good Lord. We'll say maybe pat you on the back and say good job, and that would be a that'd be a pretty good reward. Well, I'll give you a an attaboy right now, Bernie Dale does a very good job. Thanks. Well, we appreciate it a whole bunch, and uh, you know, I, like I say, we love the state of Kentucky, and we stay involved up there with you guys, and uh, and uh, know a lot of the people in Game and Fish, and a lot you know a lot of people there, and uh, you know, it's been a, it's been our pleasure for sure. Okay, Bernie, I'll let you get back to your life, and I sure appreciate you coming on and telling us the story. Uh, I appreciate it, Charles. Thank you. Two powerful players in the game of archery, Brian Markham and Bernie Morell of Morell Targets from Arkansas. We are about out of time, but I have to tell you about this. Download for free the Kentucky Boat Safe app. It has a blood alcohol estimator on there if you need it. Text a friend your float plan or text for help. You can send someone to your rescue. There's a marina finder there. It's in the App Store or Google Play. The Kentucky Boat Safe app. We are out of time. This is Charlie Bagman inviting you to join us in a week, and we will go inside, outdoors again, right here on Kentucky Field Radio.